Hi everybody. Hi everybody, I'm Chloe and this is Meet the Poet. Um, tonight will be slightly different from normal. Uh, we'll shortly be joined by our two guests, poets Francis Corky Thompson and Annie Fisher. Um, Francis and Annie have prepared a great hour of poetry where they will perform as a double act, uh, bouncing their poetry off one another and discussing each other's work. Um, you might be presented with the occasional prop or even a musical number, but all will be revealed in good time. So uh, by way of introduction, Frances Corky Thompson has a poetry MA from Exeter University. She has previously won the Ms. Lexia competition, the Arvon competition and the Sentinel Prize. Her work has been entered for the T.S. Eliot Prize and was selected by the Poetry Kit as its book of the month. Um, Annie Fisher, who is the other half of the double act, is a poet and storyteller who performs under the disguise of Arabella Storyteller and occasionally leads poetry workshops in schools. She is a member of Taunton's Fire River Poets and has released two poetry pamphlets with Happenstance Press. So welcome to home stage, Annie and Francis. Hello. Hello. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you both here this evening. Good yeah, thank to have you. you here. Thank you. Um, so just to kick off the evening, I think it will be good just to ask you, ask you both, what do you find is the inspiration for a lot of your writing? What what sort of topics and themes do you tend to write about in your poetry? Mm. <laughs> or yeah. a heavy question. question and one is never really prepared. <laughs> but uh, life is the easy answer, you know, stuff that happens. Um, your turn, Annie. <laughs> yes, yes, I mean, all sorts really, yes, quite a lot of memory. I think when I started writing, I, I, I used childhood memories quite a lot uh, but now I, I just like to, to, be, to be quite varied and also to write some serious some funny stuff uh, some, some rhyming stuff not rhyming stuff to use different forms so I, I think it's you know, keeping a mixture going really and just having oh, fun yeah. just having fun with it really yeah. we're having fun and we have found that um, in several ways we, we sort of coincide both in our influences and in the kinds of things we have written, don't we? We found that. We were, we were saying yesterday, or can we just tell you a story? We were talking about the, the, first, the first poem we wrote, both of us. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, was, it was amazing. We, uh, Francis wrote, she, I think you said you were about four or something like that when you... I was pre, I was pre-literate, you know. Very <laughs> young. Um, but um, yeah, I was two or three or something and, and uh, I said it to my mum and dad and my dad wrote it down. And uh, you were a little older, but um, can you remember yours? You you do you yours first. What are you serious? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Just say it. I'm two or three. The sun goes down behind the hill, and all is dark. You see, but whenever we go to bed, we shall go to sleep as safe as safe can be. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Oh, so, so, so Francis's poem started, uh, the sun is, what was the first line again? The sun goes down behind the hill. I, and the first poem I remember writing, I was about nine, it's the first I remember reading with my parents, and it began, the sun is sinking in the west in all its golden splendour. The little oh, flowers have gone to sleep to hide their parts so tender. And isn't it amazing? We both wrote almost exactly the same first line. Yeah, uh, what well, um, connection with the same sort of rhythm and i did wonder you know i was thinking because i think we were both probably heavily influenced by by hymn tunes as children mm. and it has that you know dear lord and father of mankind those sort of four four mm. pulses to align that i think that's um yeah maybe they're in the background quite oh, a bit. The, the the meter and the rhythm of hymn tunes is very much in a lot of uh, you know that sort of poetry that i write it isn't the only kind of poetry that i write but it influenced um, mm. very, very heavily. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when I've spoken to you both before, you've mentioned quite often the idea of, you know, making poetry fun and funny at times. And I get the impression that that's quite important in, in some of your work, keeping that fun element to it. I think the great thing about being old is you haven't, you haven't got to do this, you know, there's, there's no, you know, there's nothing, nothing to, there's no, there's no ambition there really, you know, you just do it because you want to do it. And sometimes it'll be funny and sometimes it'll go a bit deeper, I think, I think, you know. 
But um, for me, anyway, it's great not to have any need to achieve anything. You know? mm, exactly. And I think we've got a... Oh, sorry, Francis. What did you say? Sorry, I just said we write because we want to write. That's mm. the main and perhaps only uh, impetus, really. And that's the best reason, too. Yeah. Um, and I think the poetry that we've got tonight, we've got a lot to enjoy. I think we've got quite a wide range of all the different, um, I'd say, styles and focuses that you've mentioned. So I'm going to hand over to both of you now, but I will I will jump back on the screen um, every now and again to sort of feedback any comments and questions that come in from the audience. And everyone watching at home, um, you can get involved very easily just by using the online chat function on YouTube and Facebook. So type in as many questions or thoughts or um, ideas uh, that come into your head and that you want to share, and I will share them with Annie and Francis. So over to you both. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, apparently I'm going first and I'm going to read a poem uh, about a bird. This poem uh, is the first poem in the first book that I had published by Happenstance some years ago. And of course, Annie's also published by Happenstance, which is another thing we have in common. So without further ado, I'm going to go straight into this poem. Stone chat. The stone chat is not a stone chat. She is simply herself on the long twig by the stones. No, she's not even self. It all simply is. On this, the only possible perfect twig. It is look and oh and flit. All sense and verb centered in the understood measured height of the present tense where giant gravity trapped lumber at the edge intoning territory quacking winchat a related species i think this is a great poem francis i, I love this and the more i read it uh, the more i see is there although it seems very simple there's a lot going on and I love the lightness of it you know, which is like the bird but that where you say all sense and verb I was thinking because you're a language teacher aren't you you, you taught languages wow. and I was thinking you know you, you look at this bird and you're not thinking no it's not a stone chat it's actually it's a verb it's, it's a present tense it's, it's, a, it's a being it's it's a present yes. tense it's the present tense of the verb to be. I just think that's a lovely way of looking at the bird, you know. And, and then the, and the, the giants, the human beings, sort of lumbering at the end with all their, their nouns, the weight of all this language, you know. So, yes. Hey, I've got it. Once again, you're my ideal reader, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a lovely poem. And I, I, I wonder also whether... Um, you know, as, as poets, poets are always, always writing about birds. And maybe it's because, you know, we've got all this weight of languages <laughs> pressing down on us. And, and although we love words, we all, you know, we sort of envy the birds, their freedom, you know, to be sort of wordless. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's a great one. Anyway, so I was going to read a, another bird one next. It's one, one of a similar length, uh, a poem called Fledgling. Fledgling, child rearing. Birds know all about it. The blackbirds in the backyard are frazzled from feeding the fat brown idle fledgling that squats brazen on the low wall between the dustbins and the garage. I can't stay here all night watching for next door's cat. That's when I catch myself praying atheist at the kitchen window, impotent as God. The bit I like best, I have to admit, is the last three lines, Annie, because mm -hmm. it's very clever. You've packed an awful lot in there. And, and it's also a complete switch from, you know, describing the bird and the fledgling and the poor frazzled parents. And um, your maternal instincts go out the window there with this fat, brown idol 
creature. But then you go all metaphysical and religious or not, question mark. Um, you're an atheist and you're praying and you're impotent as God. And mm -hmm. you God the last word. And I just think, wow. <laughs> That's, I mean, I, God crops up quite a lot in my poems, I think, under, under the surface, you know, and I might say that I don't believe in God, but, you know, I think I protest too much because I think fundamentally I've got a religious nature, actually, I've got a, a religious that's temperament. That's what's happening in, in, that, in those last three lines, and that's what I really relate to there, um, you know, just doing that, it's fantastic. Mm. Well, you're going again now with another one, aren't you, Annie? Oh, yes. I was going to go to, to this next one, which is um, about not a small bird, uh, but a small me. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I was always the smallest child in the class growing up um, at school. So uh, this is about, about feeling small. Small. How I envied the tall girls sleek as swans, who glided along corridors while I scuttled in their wake, who could flip a netball through a hoop with a flick of a wrist and both feet on the ground. Girls built to yawn and stretch, proud as cats, who could look down on Mr Tracy and make him blush, who never needed to try never needed to rush, being already there miles before me. How I envied the unearned prize awarded to their size. And when I looked in the mirror, facing the limits of my timid geography, how I envied the beautiful maps of their limbs, extending from land's end to distant ice blonde Arctic. Brilliant, brilliant. Oh, those sporting queens with their language mm -hmm. grace, which they were probably very aware of and worked at cultivating, and they were probably just as anxious about their appearance as, you know, at that age as, as you mm -hmm. were. Um, some bits in this poem really strike me. Um, coming towards the end, you say, this, this is just really good writing. Facing the limits of my timid geography. Those two words, limits and timid, they're very sort of small and inward looking, aren't they? <laughs> I hadn't thought about it, yes. But, yeah. And, yeah, well, they're well chosen. And quite often, I think, as poets, we choose the right words for a sound without thinking too much about it. Just the right word comes sometimes. Yeah, if, so. if we're lucky and if, if you haven't, if you hadn't thought about that there, Annie, then you were lucky because, you know, it's good. I mean, there, there's so much I could say about that. There's those cats again, aren't there? <laughs> yes. 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 Yes, these tall blonde girls, yes. Oh. Ice blonde Arctic. With, with, with the world at their feet, it seemed. Oh, and hey, Mr. Tracy. Oh, I do feel for him. <laughs> yes, yeah. he, he was the Latin teacher and he was quite young and it, it was quite easy to make him blush and... Uh, and, and, and the beautiful girls used to try and do that. Yeah. Um. <laughs> and Mr. They were either as teachers or as pupils, even. <laughs> Mr. Tracy, I feel for him. <laughs> so you were going to read a, a childhood one now, Francis, I think. For me, coming up, yes. I have to give a little bit of an intro to this. Um, I grew up in Belfast, as you probably can hear, if you didn't know that already. My dad was a Presbyterian minister in Belfast, and before that, before I was born, he had been a missionary in China. That's, I'm just saying that because you kind of need to know it. Um, you also need to know for this poem, or it helps to know, um, that I uh, was an avid reader, and one of my favorite things to read was the girl comic with its school stories and its stories of um, uh, adventurous women. And the other thing is that every year, uh, the Bolshoi Ballet used to come to Belfast just after the pantomime season. We got the ballet. And Auntie Daisy took me to the ballet. So I'm going to read Nutcracker Night. 
The city glittered all the way home to my bedtime reading of girls with the wind in their hair, destined to do good. Mary Slessor from Dundee, with African children crowding at her knee for stories of Jesus. I could do that. Francis the Godly. Or Gladys Aylward, the virtuous one, shepherding orphans through Chinese mountains, Francis the godly and the intrepid. But on Nutcracker Night, I turned to Belle of the Ballet. This too offered a hard life. Later, I'd take a Russian name, but for now, this sugar plum fairy would henceforth practice religiously at the bathroom towel rail bar before she knelt in prayer. Missionary or ballet dancer, whatever calling thou hast in thy wisdom ordained, O Lord, and thine be the glory. I love it. Uh, I think Flory wants to come in in a minute, but I, I just love the fun of this, Francis. I just think it's... Um, I, I get the feeling when I read the, this that, that I always get actually when I'm with you. I always get this sort of we have this sort of playful thing going on, and uh, yeah, it's got a great, a great sense of fun. I think under, underlying that. It's, it's, it, it's de it was deadly serious as well. It, this I know. Is yes. I, that's what I, I know. I used to really wonder whether I would be a missionary or a ballet dancer. There were definitely the two careers that I was going to do, one or the other. Yes, I mean, children can be there. This is it's this, this sort of noble ambitions you can have as a child, and I think um, <laughs> there is something wonderful about it. Yes, I, I wanted to be a, a nun, or yes. I might have been a martyr. You know, I was quite happy to be burnt at the stake <laughs> if, if needs be. You know, <laughs> sorry. Hello, I'm back. Um, I almost don't want to come in because you've got such a beautiful flow going. I'm loving seeing how you're relating these tiny moments into, and you know, making these, making them into these really powerful moments of importance. Um, it's a joy to watch. But I do just have a couple of comments that have come through um, from our viewers that I thought it'd be nice to share with you both. Um, John Sullivan has said that he is so enlightened to hear you say that you don't have any particular ambitions with your poetry. Um, he's been worrying why he doesn't have any. Um, he's 60, He's 79, by the way. Um, so it's very encouraging, I think, for a lot of people to hear about just writing for the sake of writing, for enjoying it. Um, oh, well, yes. yes. John, did you say? Someone called John. John, yeah. John you're, you're just a couple of years ahead of me. And um, so I, I do relate to what you're saying. We write for the joy of it. On the other hand, it's very, very nice to be published, you know. But it's not the thing that drives me. Or I think, Annie, it's, uh, we're, we're driven by the love of writing and the need, the need to write. And yes, the speakers are perhaps a bit loud, are they? Um, little message came in there. Um, um, there there's also a um, another comment that's just come in from uh, Chrissy Banks, um, oh. who has said that she can't do much chat for listening to these fascinating poems and conversations. So <laughs> Chrissy's very much enjoying it. And she's also said she's loving having the text alongside it. And I can agree, it's so nice hearing you take bits well, out and being able to refer back to it. Sorry, um, you're um you know it's just it's just lovely for us oh i'm so pleased um i will leave it I'll, I'll i'll take myself off the screen i'll leave it um back to you and to hear more of your poetry can i just ask francis uh, when because you mentioned these these missionaries were you encouraged to read about gladys aylwood and mary slesser was, was this you they were all in the girl comic on the back page. Ah, ah. There was always there was always um, a, a story of um, someone who'd been a missionary or something similarly grand and noble. And so, so, and then, and, yeah, go on. Yeah, and my dad approved of the girl comic because its, <laughs> its editor was a man called Marcus Morris. I've got a terrible memory, but it's just it amazes me the things I do remember, and I remember that. He was called Marcus Morris, and uh, I think he was something to do with the BBC as well. But he was the editor of The Girl and the Eagle. 
um, maybe John, who asked his question, um, will remember the Eagle comic. And they had similarly uh, inspiring stories for boys. Mm, 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 mm. So do, do, you, do you think these early reading about these missionaries was partly why you ended up go, going to China yourself? Like that, no. Like no. Aylwood? that was in search of places where my dad had been. And right. uh, well, you have neatly, and thank you, Annie, led me into the next one. I went to China a few years ago, and I went more than once. And the first time I went, I traveled with my friend Chris, with whom I'd traveled before, so she knew my strange ways. And um, we, I rang her up and I said, Chris, I'm going to China. Do you want to come? Yeah, she said. Um, and I said, I'm thinking of going via the Trans-Siberian Railway. Oh, yeah, let's do that, she said. So there was no problem there. <laughs> um, and the reason I was going to China was um, because Dad had been a missionary there. And while he was there, he'd written letters home, obviously, to his mum and dad. This was way before he was married. He was a young fella. And his mum kept all his letters in a box and then when ha people moved house and this and that the letters were se seemed to have been lost didn't exist and then not that long ago um my mum said to me why don't you do something with those letters your dad wrote home from china and i said what what letters and she got them out and um there they were they she they, they were in a shoe box and she lifted the lid of the shoe box and the top letter sort of came up with the shoebox and fluttered to the ground because it was that very light airmail paper that Dad wrote on. And that was the first of his letters and the rest were all bundled down below. Five years worth of letters written regularly, uh, not once a week like his mum wrote to him, but almost as much as that. Dad's letters all travelled home on the Trans-Siberian Railway and he would have liked to go home that route himself but he couldn't because the second world war was on by then and he had to return home the way he had come via um canada and via the pacific and canada and the atlantic but uh, perhaps i've said too much this poem is just called train um and if if i was i should have said if anything lends itself to writing it is traveling on a train, particularly the train that goes from Moscow to Beijing and takes two weeks. Train. An English one is a drawing room where trees pirouette for you and the hills click past each other like a clever Victorian toy, disciplined, drawing attention. On this train, you can sleep through the Urals Siberia doesn't care. It requires no declarations about eternal hay-colored distances. On this train, we have parceled out our days in raisins and biscuits, counted soup packets for the samovar, and the Earl Grey will last just. And this train provides an absence of interference. Engine business is down to a whoosh. Self is light, unbodied as a letter. Beautiful. C can you explain this word wished, Francis? Wished, wished. Annie, is a, an Ulster word. I'm always being surprised by words that I think are ordinary. And then English people say, huh? What's that mean? Wished is a way of saying, shh, quiet. Um, you would say wished to a child, to a baby, if it was a bit, if it needed rocking, wished. Or if you were being a bit more rude or cross, you would say, hold your wished, which means shut up. Right. That's uh, wished. Uh, and and, and they've got these two last lines where you say self is light unbodied as a letter was this th thinking of your father's letters yeah 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 yeah, Very much so. yeah. And other poems in the same book i 
develop that theme as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. I like we have parceled out our days in raisins and biscuits. <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, it's much much better than the coffee spoons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Elliot's yeah. coffee spoons. Elliot. Roof rock. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the next one was was going to be. Uh, it's one of your again for you, Francis. Uh, homecoming one, isn't it? A homecoming one. Yes, this is me coming home. Um, I had been uh, reading poetry somewhere in Eastern Europe, like you do. You know, that's the kind of person I am. Not really. <laughs> But I had been, and um, it was winter time, and I'd got snowed up, and it was just before mobile phones, if any young people in the audience can imagine such a thing. Uh, I didn't have a mobile phone, nobody did. So I couldn't let my man, Robert, know that I would not be at Bristol Airport, where he was waiting for me. I shall read it now, Racing Towards Orion. We're driving out into a starry, brittle night, heading for home at last. I'd been delayed, snowed up, missed my connections. You had stayed all day at the airport, meeting every flight until I came. And there you were, just right, solid to the touch, a little disarrayed with waiting, a fortune's parking paid, we're on the road with bed and sleep in sight. With the children through binoculars, we saw peaks and craters on a wide pellucid moon and Venus rising in the afternoon. Now Orion strides the hills ahead to draw us westward back to Devon and the sea, your own bright star closer than ever to me. It's really beautiful, very beautiful, and very it's very moving, Francis. Um, and the first time I read this, I didn't I didn't actually even notice that, that it, it, uh, what an accomplished sonnet it is. You know, I think, well, and I think, <laughs> yeah, what it is. <laughs> I know, but it, it didn't. Sort of, I always think it's good if the form doesn't hit you between the eyes. You know, if you if 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 the words. Do, do their business, you know, and and then you can later on see sort of ha how it's crafted. I mean, it's very accomplished, and I find sonnets very hard to write, actually. Well, I find them very satisfactory. Yes, it's hard to write a good sonnet. In fact, mm -hmm. John Patterson, who's an expert on sonnets, the poet John Patterson, uh, he's written a whole book on sonnets, and uh, he talks about a sonnet being a little, a, a very satisfactory square shape. And it's divided at the point of the golden mean, where all art is divided. The sonnet is divided eight lines and then six lines. And that's almost the golden mean, which is eight and five. Um, art, poetry, poetry, art, uh, artists, all kind of artists of every sort. And nature as well uh, follows the same uh, sort of division uh, it's a mathematical division, the Fibonacci series of numbers, the seed heads on a a, a, a sunflower, you know, and the fir cones, and they follow that. So it's a natural thing, a natural shape. Wow. Yeah, it's just it must explain why why it survives and yeah. it seems to lend itself very well to to to, to love poetry for some reason or to. Um, yeah. And to sort of, I suppose, you know, thoughtfulness again and reflection. But uh, yes, yes. I mean, I sometimes find I start to write a, a sonnet. Um, I try and write a sonnet, and it, and it ends up not a sonnet. But that doesn't matter in the end. Do you know what I mean? That you it just somehow <laughs> have, have I find the reverse quite often. I'll start writing because I have to write whatever it is, and I'll I'll be on my third or fourth draft, and I think ah. This would be a good sonnet, <laughs> and then I'll try and make it into a sonnet. But of course, purists would probably say it's not a good sonnet. A perfect sonnet is very, very hard to do. And um, uh, Don Patterson again said, if you can, uh, he said the best sonnet is one that breaks the rules, the very strict rules. So I'm not. Like that. That. I had a break. Well, this looks. This, this is this is pretty perfect as far as I'm concerned. I have to say. It's, just, it's very, very lovely, very lovely. Um, so I, I thought I'd have a go at reading a sonnet as well, Francis, but but it's not 
you know, not as not as carefully crafted, perhaps. But um, uh, this this next one is is actually I'm calling it a sonnet because it's 14 lines and it's got a turn of sorts. Um, but it's actually a sonnet about a haiku. <laughs> And so it's called Kyoto Sonnet. And uh, I'll just say before I begin reading it that, that, that the haiku it refers to is, is a very famous one. You may have heard of it uh, from Basho that, get, that goes something like, even in Kyoto, hearing the cuckoo's call, I long for Kyoto. Uh, so it's this idea that you can be somewhere and yet still long for it somehow. So Kyoto Sonnet. Today I shared my favorite haiku with him. He listened, although poems aren't his thing. It's the one where the poet hears a cuckoo and longs for Kyoto, even though he's standing in Kyoto at the time. I spoke about the way for me, the poem perfectly articulates the existential ache anyone who has a soul must recognise. He said, for him, the poem perfectly encapsulates the limitations of the haiku as a form. And furthermore, he thought the poet sounded like a con artist. He made me laugh. He always does. I didn't try explaining how much, especially then, I longed for him. Yes, real love poem, Annie, isn't it? Really? <laughs> well, yes, it's 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 for my husband who who actually he's got a great sense of humour. He said, you know, call a haiku a poem, you know, three lines. You he said that's that's called a con artist. He was anyway. <laughs> he he didn't get the um, <laughs> the depths that I saw in this haiku, but uh, yeah. No, no, no. I think this is very good. I don't know why you don't think it's a good poem. It's a very good poem. <laughs> Hello, Flory. Can't hear you, Flory. Hi. Hello, Flory. Go on. Sorry, I was unmuted. Um, <laughs> I just came back on to say that it was it was a beautiful poem, and you are both excellent sonneteers. Um, and Anne Perrin agrees. She says it's so interesting to learn all those details about the sonnet, and she loves yours. Um, and we've got a couple of other comments as well. Um, Kay Hathaway says, I think this is about um, a few poems ago. Uh, Lettuce Leaf would be very proud to have Girl mentioned, loving the poetry. Lettuce Leaf, yeah, 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 the greenest girl in the school. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then someone else has said, um, a good old Northern Irisher saying in Hold Your Wished, immortalised now by Adrian Dunbar in Line of Duty, good to see the colloquialism in a poem, says a fellow Northern Irisher. Lovely parallel. Yeah, I get all. I I I last. I saw the last few episodes of Line of Duty. Yes, and uh, he does go mm. over overboard a little bit with his um. With quite his a few. <laughs> yeah. Quite a few things. Yeah. Um, but I believe next we've got a slightly different um poem. This is um Annie's Tom Tafferty went dancing. Um, I will let you explain a little bit about this um, because, yeah, it's, it's something different for you all to, to watch and listen to. OK, OK. So, yes, I mean, that, that last Kyoto song was, was a sort of a love poem. Uh, but as I was saying to Francis the other day, I, in a way, I think possibly all, all my poems are love poems in a certain way, you know, even if they're not overtly love poems. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're love poems to something or someone or some place. Um, so this one, Tom Tafferty Went Dancing, um, is I, I wrote when my first grandchild was born. And uh, the Welsh have this expression that true love comes with the first grandchild. And uh, but, well, I've got two grandchildren, so I, true love comes with the first two grandchildren, I must say. But anyway, yeah. I, wrote this, <laughs> I wrote this one when, when, when Thomas was born. And uh, it, it's a sort of ballad in a sort of Charles Causley sort of mode really it could be a could be a poem for children just as much as for adults i think and uh, it, it mentions places in london connected with um, my grandson's birth and people family people around at the time uh, but my good friend tony watts anthony watts who's in the fire of poets uh, very kindly set, set it to music 
and we, we've sung it a couple of times together in, in pubs, uh, but we haven't been able to get together in, in lockdown to practice it. But I have got uh, his first recording, his little demo recording uh, of this song that he, that he wrote, setting this to music. So I think we're going to hear uh, Tony uh, singing and playing it now. Tom Tafferty went dancing when the sun was in the sky. He danced a reel of summer days the length of Peckham Ride. Grandad raised a glass and Granny sang as he danced by the rectal tackle fields of Peckham Ride. Tom Tafferty went dancing when the sun was sinking low. He danced from Burrow Market all across the Pimlico. And Kitty, Katie, Matt and Sam, Harley, Ben and Joe went dancing with him down to Pimlico. Tom Tafferty went dancing when the sky was growing dark. Ten times round the turkey yoke at dusk in Dulwich Park. Light as running laughter, his heels flash gold and sparks. Like fireflies growing bright in Dulwich Park. Tom Tafferty went dancing when the moon was shining down. It led him north through Charing Cross and into Camden Town. Sure and soft as starlight, his footsteps blessed the ground. And angels dance at night in Camden Town. Tom Tafferty went dancing when the moon's on the way. Dancing through the darkness to the end of Lordship Lane. The trees cried coloured coffee leaves, the clouds cried silver rain. The likes of young Tom Tafferty would not be seen again. Oh. That is so wonderful. Thank Jim, you, Tony. I think, I think Tony's watching. <laughs> you were you were going to sing it yourself, Annie, so it's a pity you didn't hear you, but it, that was just so good. I thought you might have sung along with it. <laughs> it's great with the guitar, actually. I think it really it, it, uh, it, it, it works. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I'm very grateful to Tony for doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounded, yeah. Sounded great. And it, it's nicely presented the way the um that came up on the screen just gradually there that was good too uh it's such a joyful ballad it is a ballad did you know that um ba the word ballad and the word ballet both come from the latin ballare to dance no i didn't no i didn't aha uh -huh. so Very good interesting i found that the out. link we haven't we haven't planned that had we but yes yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the link, isn't it? I mean, this is so. I mean, it's like it's a hymn of praise, isn't it, to his existence, this new baby? Yes, and I think I must have just been feeling so happy at the time, and yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it's got it's got it's got a sense of um, being a very very old song as well, because all those places in London being mentioned and. And so on. I mean, there might well have been a Tom Tafferty. In the yes, back. well, yes. I mean, he do, he does get about a bit. I mean, if any, anybody who knows London, most of this is, is South London. But um, you know, I had to get him to, to Camden Town, and it's partly for the rhyme, you know. So he he, he does move about a bit. But most of those places were, um, you know, Dulwich Park and and Lordship Lane are all to do with the places where um, yeah, where yeah. they live, you know, and all the all all the people the people in the family there. Yeah, that was fun. Magical things you put into it, like light is running, laughter, his heels flash, golden sparks, and uh, sure and soft as starlight. Oh, you know, it's just so beautiful, really beautiful, and very yeah. simple. I can I can imagine people singing that all together. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I think he was Irish, Tom Tafferty. That name's Irish, Tafferty. Yes, I I think I. I, I do you know when I, I first wrote it, and I called it Tom Tickleton, which is what we used to call him as a baby. It was like a baby, that, and that, but that wouldn't have been right, you know. Uh, so I, uh, it's nice for a baby, yeah. isn't it? but yeah, I think yeah. it's, it's absolutely right for a folk song type song yeah. as this is. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was going to say something else. I've forgotten. Uh, never mind. 
Yeah. But, yeah, do you want, do you want to do your next one? Because we, we, we're still thinking about children and joyousness. I think. Uh... Yes, we are. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, it. Tom Tafferty, his, it's an, an Irish name, Tafferty, but your uh, tune is English, you know, a beautiful minor key with all that sort of mm. yearning longing in it, a bit like green sleeves. Mm. <laughs> yes, it's a lovely tune. It's very singable, yeah. Yes. Well, um, mine is about a child as well, uh, not a grandchild, although I do have grandchildren. Um, this is about my son, Ben, and this is about something that happened about 40 years ago. I didn't write this 40 years ago, but I remembered it. Uh, I remembered what Ben said. We were, in, we were in France, we were by the sea, and sound, lovely sunshine, and Ben said, I want to run on grass. And I, I can remember him saying it, and um, this is what this poem has come out of. Wanting to run on grass. After a few days in the sandy house with sandy children by a sandy beach, Ben, who was four, said that he wanted to run on grass. But there was no grass, only sand and road. Then we remembered a grassy place near the gates of Saint Malo, because it was Ben's holiday too. We left Judith with the French family and went. The grass was a mile or two away. For the last part of our journey, Ben rode piggyback. When we reached the grass, I set him down and he ran and ran and ran. He ran until he was a distant blue and red scamper. Then he ran back then off again. Under a tree, we drank water, shared an apple, positioned the bits of core between grass blades for the ants, said biodegradable. Grass being half rooted and half free is better for running on than sand. Grass grounds the foot. At lift off, each shoot lends its own thrust. That's marvellous. Mm -hmm. I love the exhilaration you get into this, this, this child running here. You know, he ran and he ran and he ran until he was a distant blue and red scamper. Yeah. And then he ran back, then off again. Yes, it's just lovely, really lovely. And it's just so obviously absolutely true and real, you know. Just picture every bit of it, biodegradable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you, you travelled a whole mile to find this bit of grass for him. Yeah, yeah. I remember where it was and I had to heave him up on my back. <laughs> I remember when, when, my, when my son was about, um, he's similar age, and he when he was about... Um, Two, I think he used to go into the back garden and say, I, I want to run in the wind. And he'd put his arms out, yeah. you know, and run up and down the garden path. So there's something in, in young children that they, I suppose, it's preparing them for <laughs> flying the nest or whatever. They just need the to run. And yeah. I think, yeah, you know, we the, the way we prepare our children to leave us, we push them out, don't we? We, we encourage them to go, we encourage their independence. And yeah. that poem has really grown with the years, you know, mm. uh, because he lives abroad now and uh, I don't see him as much as I would like to. Um, yes. But we might yeah. get to see him quite soon now. So that would be good. Oh, yes, good. Lovely. And, and his lovely family. Anyway. Yes, it's, it's there in, in that last verse, isn't it? Half rooted and half free. This. Yes, exactly. Yes. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, um, we, so if, if we better move on, I think, and the next one is, um, yes, yeah, yeah, to staying with, uh, staying with, with your, this is another one about my grandson. Um, um, my grandson's um, on, on the autistic spectrum, and he's got the most incredible mind and uh, has many interests, uh, maps is one thing, but, but um, animals above all, and he loves to visit, visit zoos. 
And so uh, this poem, which I've called The Jungle Waits Outside, My Best Beloved, with a sort of a bit of a, a nod to Kipling, I think, in the title probably, um, is, is really about my you know, love for him, but, but, you know, worries as well you know, about him. So this is about a day when we went to Exmoor Zoo, which is quite near you, I think, Francis, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So this is um, The Jungle Waits Outside, My Best Beloved. Another zoo, another information board, another wild encounter talk. I'm old and neurotypical. The facts and stats glide through my head and out the other side. You, on the other hand, remember everything. Your nine-year-old extraordinary mind could itemise if asked the 85 names humankind has given to the puma. At the end of our day out, you asked what animal I loved most in Exmoor Zoo, and I said, guess. You thought perhaps the binturong, which smells, you said, like popcorn. Or judging by my oohs and ahs, maybe the superb starling, the scarlet ibis or the gloriously grumpy, tawny frog mouth. When I said, no, you are my favorite animal, I knew I disappointed you. The look that flashed across your face told me I'd made a category mistake. But later you said, thanks, Granny. Today has been the best. And yes, it was. We were so safe among the cages. This is a fantastic portrayal of this remarkable child. And it's ripe with longing. And maybe a little bit of fear for what the future might hold, but we're safe. And paradoxically, we're safe um, within the cages. Among the, well, among the cages, yes, we have to be among the cages. And he's safe in the cage of childhood still, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably the one poem of mine that's probably the, the, the dearest to me, I have to say, because it's, uh, yeah, yeah of where it comes from. It's very dear and very, de very detailed. Beautiful. So I don't know how we're doing for time, Francis or Flory, what we should be doing next. Are we going to do the goat bells? We must, we must do the goat bells. We're okay, apparently. Two more poems mm. then an encore, apparently. That's what I read on the corner. Great, great. Uh, some years ago, I did a poetry course on the island of Crete. Wonderful. And the um, poetry tutor a wonderful poet called Linda Chase. Uh, she's a, she taught creative writing in Manchester University along with Carol Ann Duffy. And uh, she taught us. And uh, unfortunately, uh, she died a few years ago, a few years after uh, this event on Crete, these events on Crete. One of her tips for writing a poem while we were there was we had to Choose something that meant something to us. Um, anything could be anything, um, but but um, just write about and around it, explore it, go underneath it, above it, everything about it that you can possibly manage to uh, gather. And so that's what I did. I'm going to read the goat bells. The goat bells in memory of Linda Chase. I want to know about the goat bells because their small hollow knocking is in my head. I want to know if a bell might be worn by many goats in succession, if it might be generations, centuries old, and if a child in the village might wake to the very same music as her mother did and her grandmother and her great-grandmother. 
I want to know about the bell maker hammering out the tin cup and hanging the tiny clapper. Did the bell maker test the bell for tone and timbre with a particular goat in mind? So that when you open your shutters and the light rushes in and you hear a near familiar tapping and talking, you can say, ah, my goat Mariah is there. And did the bell maker die long ago? And is their name remembered in the village? And is bell maker said along with the name? And is that name sometimes given to a new baby? Or are they disposable bells that arrive in large boxes all the way to the island from Athens or Shanghai? I want to know what a bell means to its goat. Do the bells at first drive the goats nearly mad? And do they in the end settle for this madness as they settle for the high winds in the worlds where their clever feet take them and the sweet still places they know and the fragrant scrunch of time and the daily giving of the blessing of their milk. And I want to know if at the last it is the bell's kiss on the air that betrays the goat to the man with the knife. For the bell sounds the goat, its toings and froings, its choices and changes and the silence of the bell is the goat's musing and sleeping. I want to know about the goat bells, for their faint hollow harmonies are knocking at the bowl of the mountains under the sun against the silvered pulse of the sea. my favorite poem of yours Francis I absolutely adore this poem I'm so in admiration of it it's just gorgeous really gorgeous there's Thanks. a timelessness it's oh guess your bell yes and I ring my goat bell <laughs> a friend made this goat bell for me recently um because of that poem wasn't that lovely now it's it just a sound, but if you put your fingers on it that's the sound you hear because Obviously, it's banging against the goat's chest or whatever part of the goat it rings, it bangs against. But thank you. I had to give the bell a little. Absolutely. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it, ev it evokes, doesn't it, sort of you know, Greek islands and that sort of Mediterranean way of life. But, but, it, but there's also, there's, a, there's, there's so much more there. There's a sort of yearning and a, a timelessness and uh, this idea of history passing through you know in a sort of unchanged way uh, and, and this yearning that we talked about earlier I think is is is, is in there and you, you just get so much subtly going on there yes I I wrote it on Crete and um it's it's one that I didn't have to do much work on afterwards at all sorry we've I lost you for a minute there. Oh, you've come back. I, I said I, I wrote it on Crete and, um, you know, I didn't have to fix it afterwards. I got it all done there and then, which just came. Oh, it's amazing. I don't think I wrote it really. It just came. It wrote itself. Really? Yes. Wait, and, and this repetition of I want to know, I want to know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's got a prayerful quality as well in that way. I think it's just really a beautiful, beautiful poem. And uh, yeah, fantastic. I'm, I'm envious of having written that. It's just fabulous. Right. Um, should we should we move on because of I think we've got time for one more before we do a, maybe yeah I think um, yeah we're going to do uh, one called Sitting with Friends now, which is another sort of reflective poem, and this is just basically really about I think being in a room on your own and being okay with that being on your own isn't always okay um, but it can be absolutely okay sometimes this is called sitting with friends today i am friends with the sunshine and the long long time i'm friends with the whistling of the man next door and his uninvited music which i've become accustomed to i'm also enjoying a fleeting relationship 
with the shadow of the jasmine on the carpet. But the little cross-legged Buddha on the mantelpiece is my most steadfast friend. He says he's read the letter in the envelope I tucked behind his back. He says he understands. I am living companion to this dark wooden furniture. Its heaviness and sadness comforts me. And I'm on pretty good terms with this bamboo back scratcher. Allen Ginsberg put a back scratcher in a poem once, and now I've done it too. I am a friend to fortune any day, a friend to anything that shines out there beyond the corner of my eye, and friend to what may come out of the blue. I am friend to all my dead. I am friend to the late afternoon light and have dedicated myself to the company of quiet sighs. I am friend to these faded curtains with their mildew speckled hems. And I'll be friends, I promise you, quite soon with a pan of small potatoes in the kitchen. They're waiting for me now, salty, cool and white, impatient water. Absolutely lovely, Annie. I think you're inviting us into your brain there. There's a sort of resignation, but a very, very joyful resignation to the way life is. And it's just very powerful. There's a beautiful sort of moment of stillness at the end. It is a it's a really beautiful poem, Annie. Um, and I, I've just jumped on quickly because we've got so many comments of people saying how much they love both of your poetry. So I'll, I'll cherry pick just a few that I can fit in before we finish. But um, we've had um, Chrissy has Chrissy Banks has said, wow, that's so gorgeous, Francis. So much in there. And I love the insistence of I want to know. Um, Anne Osborne says that she loves Francis Goatbell poem. John Sullivan, in response to your poem just now, Annie has just said, wow, I completely understand that. Um, another commenter on Facebook um, has just said, beautiful poems, thank you. Um, I've loved to hear your introductions and discussions also, which has added so much for us listeners, thank you. Um, very well received poems, obviously you've been a massive hit tonight and it has been so lovely to listen to all of your work and listen to you chat. Um, I feel like I've been a fly on the wall, just having a lovely night listening to you both have a good time. Um, we have got just enough time to hear one more poem from both of you as an encore. Um, so I think, Francis, if you'd like to read your last poem first, um, you're reading Keyboard, I believe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Keyboard, anything you want to write, long or short or wise or trite, cosmopolitic or tribal, all of Shakespeare plus the Bible, Dickens, Dante or Dan Brown, any can be written down, all your base salacious panderings, all your spiritual meanderings, plus if you're a polyglot, full translations of the lot, whether babbled, screeched or sung, in a hundred kinds of tongue, print demystified, unfurled by three quarters of the world, words that will not rhyme or scan, words that will and words that can, words like thirty, flirty, dirty, trust the good old keyboard, keyboard qwerty, letters numbering twenty-six, other keys with subtler tricks, lots of which I cannot master, touch that one and court disaster. Never for a moment be bored with your quirky, quirky keyboard. <laughs> Great tongue twister there at the end. <laughs> Fantastic. Are we That's talking about, I think we'll go straight into Bollard. So uh, this this one, Bollard, I, I wrote this on, a, on an Arvon course uh, quite, quite a few years ago with, with Helen Nelson and Michael Lasky, and we had to write a poem about a word. So this is a word that I didn't know until quite late in life. Bollard. I was 21 before I came to know the word. I, who loved the sound of 
obfuscate, opaque, very similitude, had failed somehow to stumble upon Bollard. Perhaps because the nuns had balked at it, finding it rude, the double L's so brazenly erect, intruding there between the gasping vowels, the ah, oh, the ah, oh, Bollard. A blustery, hot potato in your mouth sort of a word, suited to the flabby lips of large mustachioed men. Bollard, dear boy, Bollard. A word that some might think quite similar to bollock or to buttock, but without the crispy bite of C and K, that satisfying kick and click you find in, say, hillock, hammock, pillock, pollock, hackensack, and cadillac, which doesn't have a K, in little words like quick and lick and flick and flack and flock and fuck, I'm driving up a cul-de-sac, bollard. Oh. oh, brilliant. Both such excellent word plays and bringing us back to what we were talking about at the beginning, which is the fun side of poetry that you can have with it. Um, absolutely incredible. Thank you so much, both of you, Annie, France, Annie and Francis, for joining us tonight. Um, I've had, as I said, I've had a wonderful time watching you both. Um, and thank you to everyone at home who has tuned in and sent in such lovely comments. Um, you can sign up to the uh, poetry mailing list if you'd like to find out about any similar events that happen in the future like this one. There's a link at the bottom here and also in the comments um, in the information section of these feeds. Um, thank you so much for to both of you. You've been an absolute delight to have this evening. Yeah, we've had the best time thank ever. That's great. Thank I'm you so for glad. having us. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Thank you so have much. Have a wonderful yeah. rest of the evening, both of you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Francis. Bye, Florence. Bye. Bye.